Okay, I think we'll get started. Thanks uh, very much for joining us, everybody. And welcome to the latest in the series of the GPSA webinar series. Tonight's session is being uh, presented by Dr. Robin Park and Dr. Harry uh, Rob is the National Assessment Advisor for the Applied Knowledge Test, or the AKT, as would uh, as it would be uh, known most commonly to all of you. And Gary Butler is the National Clinical Lead for Assessment Assessment Development and Education Services. Uh, you would only have to spend a couple of hours in the offices of GPSA after the results are released to understand just how much um, your registrar's passing their written exams means to not only the registrars, but to uh, you, the supervisors as well, which is why we're running this uh, webinar. And we'd like to thank Gary and, and Robin for their contribution tonight. Now, I would like to, um, given that we're at the AEDA conference in Darwin tonight, broadcasting out around the country to acknowledge the country, uh, and the traditional owners of the land in which this meeting is taking place and pay respects to their elders past and present and to their families. We'd like to acknowledge the RACGP. Obviously, their contribution tonight is vital in terms of being able to bring you the content that you need and to understand how to support your registrars best. And obviously, GPSA is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Practice Planning Program, so we're incredibly grateful to them. Now, without further ado, I'm actually going to hand you over to uh, Gary. Gary, are you able to share your screen? Okay, thanks, Glenn, and thank you for inviting us in. Um, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen, um, and this will go for our presentation. Good, and you don't have to look at me either. That's even better. Okay, thank you. Um, Rob, are you there? I am. Good evening, Gary. Good evening. Thanks, Rob. Um, so thank you again, Glenn, for inviting us. It's great to be able to share um, with you um, the sort of information and try and demystify and debunk some of the myths around the RACGP's written assessments, the AKT and the KFP. And Rob and I are going to share this um, webinar. Um, and this is the first time I've used Zoom, so forgive me. Um, and uh, if I hit the wrong button, um, well, here we go. Rob, over to you for the first first slide. No worries. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, so um, my name's Rob. Oh, you to try it, Gary, or do you want to go back a step? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I've used Zoom before, but this uh, but Gary's in charge. So and when Gary gets control of the microphone or control of the mouse, it's, it's always a bit of fun. So uh, we'll see how we go. Thanks, Gary. But um, yeah, so my name's Dr. Rob I'm a GP um, on the Sunshine Coast. Um, so my primary job is working in clinics, um, as is uh, the majority of people who are probably listening to this as well. Um, but obviously, I work for the RACGP as the National Assessment Advisor for the AKT, <coughs> and I've been doing that role for um, well, at least the last three and a half years, so the last sort of seven papers or so that we've done. Um, so it's, it's been a, a good experience, a good learning experience. Prior to that, I was working, um, I have a master of clinical education, and I was working uh, with GPRA in some exam prep stuff uh, prior to uh, coming on board with RSUGP. So we'll talk a little bit more about tonight or later on tonight about uh, how you guys as supervisors can help uh, hopefully assist your uh, registrars, candidates um, and doctors to get through their examinations, which is uh, ideally what we want to come to at the end of tonight. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the key things to keep in mind uh, with the RSUGP assessment, so, um, and there are three key aspects to the RSUGP assessment. Um, firstly is the AKT or the Applied Knowledge Test, uh, which is essentially a multiple choice paper. There's the KFP or the Key Feature Problem Paper, uh, which is more of a short answer question, clinical reasoning um, and um, assessment paper. And then we have the OSCE, which is our um, live examination. Um, that the candidates will go to a, a live centre and uh, be examined often by their supervisors, so probably by a lot of you guys, which is, which is great. The key thing to keep in mind for the candidates when you're preparing them and when they're asking you questions and when they're interested in preparing for their exams is 
what are we actually aiming for? What target are we looking at? And one of the key things to keep in mind is that the examinations are designed to allow unsupervised practice as a general practitioner anywhere within the country. Um, and essentially that is where we draw the line in the sand. Um, so congratulations to the Shivi Fellowship. You are now able to go out into the wide blue yonder or the very dry yonder currently in Australia um, and work on supervised. And it's uh, really important that we keep that in mind when we're thinking about the level of knowledge that these candidates need to know. Um, so, Gary, can you go on the slide? <coughs> so, the key tonight is, yeah, we're going to go through the why, where, when, how, what and who. Um, Gary, are you right if I sort of fill in this sort of detail now? or? Do you want to talk on this later, or are you happy for me to give a bit more background? You, you, you go for it, Rob, that's fine. Yeah, great, okay. So um, so for the applied knowledge test, to give people a little bit of background here for those who may not be, uh, or may not, may not have sat in the examinations, which is certainly quite possible for a lot of supervisors who've been working in a practice for a long time, um, or those who are, um, may have sat the exams quite some time ago. The exams have gone through a dramatic change. Um, the structure of the exam is still pretty similar um, in that um, it's, uh, it's still an MCQ or an applied knowledge test, it's still a key feature problem paper and it's still the OSCE. Um, but the way those processes have gone uh, have changed quite significantly. The quality of the paper has improved dramatically. The efforts that we've gone to to try and, things like tonight, to try and debunk some myths and, and make things as easy um, as possible for candidates to demonstrate their knowledge to us so that we know that those who are capable and able to be working in unsupervised practice are able to do so. Um, and that's, that's the key of what we're, what we're aiming to do. Um, all the examinations are now done online, so they're all done on computers. Um, so people will be going to uh, examination centres for their exams um, and they will be allocated a computer each and they will then sit their papers. The key feature problem paper is done uh, on the Friday, uh, usually, and then the uh, AKT or applied knowledge test is done on a Saturday. So in the past, those two exams used to be done on the same day. Uh, which for a, a seven and a half hours of examinations was pretty brain blowing. Uh, I did it back in those Sundays, but now it's actually split over two days um, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, to make life a bit easier for the candidates, but certainly also uh, for um, uh, for some of our logistical problems as our numbers have increased. Uh, so that's really important to be aware of. Gary, do you want to go next slide? So a little bit more detail. So for the applied knowledge test, it's 150 multiple choice questions and it's done over four hours. Um, the, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but the key thing here is that, that we're talking about applied knowledge um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more exactly what that means. But these are not the same multiple choice questions that you might have got at medical school. Um, these are designed to be specialist or fellowship level uh, questions. Um, all work unsupervised in the country. So it's not going to be what is the first line management for blood pressure. You know, that's the sort of thing that you might learn at medical school. This will be more complicated. The patient might have comorbid disease. The, the person might have uh, maybe a high blood pressure in the room, but their home blood pressure is fine. Or they may have some significant contraindications to certain medications. Um, given in their clinical history, therefore the first and maybe even the second line blood pressure medication you might otherwise pick off the shelf may not be appropriate for that person. So, so that's the sort of place that we're trying to pitch these exams is not, not medical school level, this is fellowship level exams. Um, and therefore we write the questions very much based towards that. Gary, do you want to talk to the next slide on the cafe? Yep, um, thank you very much. So the key feature of problem paper um, is a paper which is based on the premise of testing, clinical reasoning and critical thinking. So it's taking the, um, the applied knowledge that we see within the AKT and then building on that to see if they can actually start integrating that and applying that knowledge within a specific context and seeing a patient through um, a, a clinical process. Our paper is 26 cases. Um, which is a rather strange number, I admit. 
and uh, um, it's lost in the midst of time why we have 26 cases but we do and um, our paper is over three and a half hours um, and as Rob said it's done online it's a free text <clears throat> exam so the candidates have to type in their answers um, and we'll come to how we require them to answer that later on in this presentation but it's over three and a half hours and for both our exams <clears throat> we have um, the, the exam is intended to be able to be completed in um, as Rob said, three and a half hours for the AKT and three hours for the KFP and we have the extra half hour for all candidates um, for those who have English not as their first language or their typing skills may not be as good so everyone gets that extra half hour um, and that saves us having to go through um, hundreds of applications for special consideration for extra time. I'm not sure if people are aware we have 1400 candidates on average our KFP exam um, twice a year. Rob, how many within the AKT? Yeah, 12 to 1300, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a lot of candidates sitting the exam um, and it's running cut centres all over Australia, um, uh, not just in the major cities. We actually have candidates sitting the, loca um, the exams online in remote locations as well. Rob? Yeah, so I'll talk to this one. So a, a key question that we often get asked about the exams is where are these come from? And um, I, I'm, I'm still involved with quite a <clears> few sort of social media groups in regards to people who are sitting their exams. And it's always fascinating to read some of the myths and things that come through. And that's partly what we, we're trying to do tonight and through presenting at GP Tech, which we presented at last uh, a couple of weeks ago. We presented at the additional general practice registrar network just a week ago. We presented at the national conference, etc. <coughs> um, and we'll talk a bit more about what's available tonight. But the, the whole point of this is to try and debunk some of those myths that are out there. So one of the other big myths that a lot of people think is that you know these questions are written by um, people in ivory towers in, in tertiary centres or by, uh, by subspecialists or, or non-GP specialists. Um, but I think a key thing that I really want to get across tonight is that these questions are written, the questions are reviewed, uh, the marking is done, and the path marks are set all by practicing RACGP fellows, um, the uh, vast majority of which are not even employed by RACGP other than on a contractual basis um, where they're paid by the hour to assist us with these, with these processes. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind is um, these are practicing GPs. These are these are you guys. So the questions when people send in their questions um, uh, that they they want to have within the exam, these are within their realm of expertise. These are within what they're seeing. So what I see in my clinic in in the Sunshine Coast may well be different to one of my writers who uh, lives out in Darwin, which then might be different to one of my writers who lives in the middle of Sydney, works in a transgender sexual health clinic. So um, what we see is, is different. Having said that, we try and always generalise the questions across the country. So these are all um, things that uh, we will all see every day. And this is this is the other key myth that, that comes into a lot of the exams is that uh, we assess minutiae and odd, oddities and things like that. What, what we find interestingly and what, what is well known in the literature is that the um, candidate when they leave the room there might have been 149 questions on diabetes but there was one maybe on myasthenia gravis and they will remember the one on myasthenia gravis far more than they remember the diabetes heart failure and the, uh, um, and the other sort of barn door things that comes through our door. It's interesting we, we kind of do the same thing with our clinic when we when we talk to colleagues and it's like oh I had this patient who had this. We don't often go and talk about oh yeah my patient had diabetes oh I put them on that form and it was great. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so it's important to keep that, that in mind as well, is that we are incredibly mindful that when we write these exams, we're looking for the uh, people to know fairly in depth the common things for diabetes, COPD, and things like that. So important to keep in mind that the exams are uh, all written, reviewed, past mark is set, and the marking is done uh, by you guys. Do you want to go to the next slide, Gary? Yep. 
Coming to that, and uh, each individual question, so the basic birth of a, of a question is um, one of our writers will write us a question. And Gary, I think you'll be happy as well if we put up the email at the end if people are interested in becoming writers. Um, we can, uh, we're always welcome to take on some more writers. But yeah, so someone across the country will write a question, it will be sent in, be reviewed by myself or one of my other two MEs that are on my team. The question will then go backwards and forwards between us several times. Then it will be signed off by uh, another expert um, who's been doing these questions for a long time, well, with us for years. Um, then it will be sent out for further review to uh, another bunch of questions that people will come back. Those will be reviewed again. Um, the, all the changes will be added. New references will be added. It will be then sent out again to another bunch of GPs. Those will then come back again. The exam will then be trial run. So um, each of the questions that we then have polished up will then be tested to see if GPs across the country will be getting these correct. Um, or it's common enough knowledge that the majority of them will do well. Um, and then that will come back, they will be selected, they, the exam will be sat. After the exam is sat, uh, we then have 22 GPs flown in from all over the country to come and sit down in, in Melbourne for an entire day for a very fun eight hours where we discuss each individual question in turn. They will have had time to read all the questions, review them, read all the references and check them more. Um, so by the end of the day, oh, plus all the extra emails and comments and questions I get either through social media or from emails directly to RSUGP about this question, that question, and the other thing. Um, oh, I didn't even add, we actually have an expert review panel as well afterwards for any questions that statistically don't match up. Those all get retested as well. So et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before I bore you all into sleep, you can see how much or how intense the QA cogs of this machine are behind the scenes. Um, and all of this is essentially independent of Gary and myself um, in that we, we we have to keep it independent and separate away from ourselves. So there's no um, question of, of bias or manipulation of results. So, and these are all practicing GPs. Every single one of those steps, every single one of those people um, who's been involved in those steps are practicing GPs that have to be actually seeing patients. Um, so, um, so that's the sort of level of rigor uh, that goes through into each and every individual AKT question. So 34 different RSCGP fellows will see each individual question. Um, and the KFP <clears throat> is even more. Gary. Yep. So with the KFP, um, whoops, doesn't want to play. Um, we have 40 um, RSCGP fellows involved. Um, our our Q&A processes, sorry, our writing processes and our Q&A processes are um, identical to Rob's um, with the AKT. What we undertake uh, is all the all the whole paper gets sent to a group of reviewers who are selected from across the country from all, all facets of general practice. They give us feedback. Um, they let us know if they think it's an appropriate exam, it's fair, <clears throat> and we've covered across the curriculum and sampled appropriately. And then once that comes back and we modify, we then actually get um, 15 GPs um, across the country who put their hand up to actually sit the KFP online in real time in the examination environment, the online exam environment that the candidates will do. And so they actually put themselves through the paces of the exam. And we have some of our trialers uh, do this twice a year, um, every year, uh, which I think is incredibly brave of them. And the purpose of doing that is to make sure the questions work because it's, it's, it's actually very difficult to write a good KFP question. And so often the answers, <clears throat> the answers to the, the, that the exam writer might give us are because that's the, they have an idea where this case is going. But when you come to this question and this case without the knowledge of where the question is gonna end up, sometimes you find candidates go down a very different path and the question can go down a different path. So one of the purposes of trialing the exam with our GPs is to actually make sure that the questions function. And once they've all completed, um, we mark their papers um, we do not give them their answer, their, their scores, but I can say, um, as you've heard me say maybe at conferences, I've yet to refer anyone to APRA, but we, we, we really value their time in doing it, and I think it's incredibly brave. And, and as Rob said, if anyone wants to get involved in any of the assessment processes, we'll put the uh, email up at the end where you can contact us. And then 
once we've had the Q&A process and the trialing, we also have a publications to review to ensure we're, we're not using uh, grammar and we're not using English that would be inappropriate or would, to sort of remove uh, jargon, to remove uh, colloquialisms, and also to make sure we've avoided things like double negatives or confusing statements. So that really helps. Now, once that's that, then we go to the exam, the exam itself. And for the KFP, because you've because it's a handwritten exam, um, we then have and it's online. We then have markers actually having to mark the candidates. For the KFP, <clears throat> there's approximately seventy-two items across the whole exam and across the whole 26 cases and we have 72 markers each cycle or the same number of questions and each marker will mark the same question 1400 times which <clears throat> is a labor of love and again you could be um, you could join in the party on that one if you so wish to because we're always looking for new markers um, to be involved in the process but the reason we use the same marker to mark every single question, um, or oh, sorry, every single candidate on the same question, is that we have internal consistency with their marking. And to ensure this consistency, we actually have a quality assurance process where the markers are marked to ensure they are applying the, the answer grid consistently from the beginning to the end of the paper. <clears throat> also from the beginning of the candidates to the end of the candidates. And if there are, if there's any inconsistencies happening, then one of my superpowers as the National Assessment Advisor is I can stop the marking and we can then have a discussion with the examiner. If I feel that the marking is not uh, consistent at all, then I can ask that marker to go back to the beginning and restart the marking. <clears throat> so we know that well, we've never had to do that. and we actually know that our markers are consistent across all 1,400 candidates. And that's really important to know because often when candidates fail their exam by two, one, two, three percent, they often will appeal, um, hoping that they'll manage to get an extra one percent to push them across the line. The first thing is an, an appeal will never change the outcome of your exam. Um, but also there are multiple quality assurance processes in place after the exam to make sure candidates, the mark that the candidate get is truly the mark that they have. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more of that as we move on. So, Rob, I think yeah, so, I'll speak to this. Um, yeah. yeah, so <clears throat> as you may have seen through either the public reports or from um, discussions that you may have heard, the pass mark for each exam changes from cycle to cycle. That's because um, the college undertakes a standard setting process where it gets a panel of experts, and I'm not going to go into detail here, we can do that offline if you'd like to know, but we use a process called modified ANGOF, which basically means a group of experts are in a room and they go through a process of setting the difficulty for every single item in the exam. And so if it's a, a difficult question, they deem that's a difficult question, it will be given um, a lower pass mark um, for each for that item. If it's an easy question or an easier question, that will get a higher pass mark. And <clears throat> that way, the the total the, the the mark of the whole exam is effectively the 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 average the mean of all of those pass marks. So we have all these people in the room who are all fellows, and we select from across the states and territories um, and across the different um, environments of general practice and they come together and they effectively set the difficulty of the exam and that's why the pass mark changes from cycle to cycle um, and I'll, we can go into that if there's questions at the end but <clears throat> I think we move on so we have that time for questions um, this slide just looks at shows you and shows you how there is a correlation between those candidates sitting the exam and passing uh, each component. <clears throat> and it's that progression up the, the pyramid, Miller's pyramid on the right, um, the, the, the nose to the nose how to the shows how and the does. And you can see that if you, 
um, you can pass your AKT um, pass your a and KFP together. Fifty-six percent of the candidates doing that, um, uh, with eleven percent passing the AKT, failing the KFP, um, and then finally the one we have twenty-six percent who fail both. And this is this is for those candidates who sit both exams in the same cycle. So this in two thousand and nineteen, we had almost eleven hundred candidates. Who was sitting the AKT and the KFP at the same time within the same cycle? So it's looking at that data, um, and this is from within the um, the public report as well. We talked about the quality assurance, Rob. Yeah, so I touched on this a little bit before, um, and I'll, I'll talk to it a little bit, but I, I won't harp on the point. But it, it, the AKT is very much not about just knowing a single a single piece of knowledge, um, and that's that's what we want to get away from. It's about um, applying knowledge to a clinical scenario, uh, which is essentially the, the basis or the, the root of clinical reasoning. Um, a, a blood pressure of 130 on 80 may mean one thing to one person, but may mean something entirely different to another. Uh, and make that person pregnant and their normal blood pressure be 90 on 60 and give them some protein and perhaps some, some problems with their reflexes, et cetera, um, and put them in the third trimester and this person suddenly becomes, uh, their blood pressure suddenly is no longer normal um, <coughs> as, a, as a basic example. Um, let's go on to the next slide, Gary. Um, and I think I've, I've pointed this out. Um, I'll just touch on, so, uh, I'm just going to give a, a very brief example of, of the same sort of thing. So a, a good example would be a, a medical school level question, what is the most common cause of hematuria? Um, you could go to a textbook, look up the most common cause and memorise it and that would give you an answer. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything necessarily about the patient who's in front of you. So in regards to this being useful as a, as a specialist uh, within a, a general practice room, knowing the core, most common cause of hematuria is a useful piece of knowledge to have but it then needs to be applied within the context of the patient. Uh, you can't just go, oh, hematuria is the most common. I've seen 10 people today with hematuria um, and you know, uh, you're know number three, so you must have the same thing. It doesn't quite work that way, as we all know incredibly well in general practice. Um, so rote learning will help you less in this exam than, than a standard medical school exam. Can you go to the next slide? And the next one, then. So the AKT is really focusing on this nose and then knows how it's, it's not so much the shows because you can't actually show what <coughs> you do next or what examination you might do next, but it's very much putting together the, the nose. So you've got the piece of information and then you know how to actually apply that. Do you want to go to the next slide? Okay. Um, oh, this is going to be awkward. You're going to have to press it a few times. So for That's example, okay. So, so, okay, oh, so for, uh, <laughs> I can't control it. Uh, so for example, a good question on hematuria would be, um, it would ask things about uh, epidemiology and maybe some evidence-based principles as well. Uh, so if you knew some of that, that might help you get to the right answer. Next one, Gary. Um, it might ask, it might have some bits requiring uh, knowledge regarding what you might see on a dipstick or what you might not see on a dipstick. It requires some understanding of anatomy. So is, is the bleeding coming from upper or lower possible causes? Is it glomerular or non-glomerular? Um, which comes to the pathophysiology and which diseases might occur in the upper tracts versus those that occur in the lower tract. Um, and it might then also uh, require some understanding about what comes next, what the specialist might do, what, what do we want the specialist to do as GPs? We, we decide where our patients go and what, what sort of test investigations we want done. We don't just say, oh, this person's got blood in the urine, quick, send them to urologist. Uh, we, as general practitioners and as uh, unsupervised general practitioners, uh, we need to be able to work these patients up appropriately um, before deciding or asking our subspecialist colleague, colleagues uh, what we'd like them to do. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, if we just go to the next one. So um, this is just a, this is not actually a question, but this is one that I've just plucked out or wrote uh, a little bit ago, just as an example. So uh, Paul Young, 85 years, had some dysuria and urinary urgency for the past week. Today, you know, since the urine appears red, Paul makes cigarettes, he's a drinker, um, he takes from emperor. 
So, for example, just in this simple little stem, um, we've got, um, the question is what's the most appropriate initial investigation? So we're not even asking for the most uh, for a diagnosis. So what we're doing here is the anatomy. So as we said before, is this upper or lower tract? You might consider that in regards to which investigation you might choose or what you might want to do next. Um, you want to think, okay, this is a male who's 85 years old. So blood in the urine for a, a male who's 85 years old going to be incredibly different to a 22 year old who um, recently had sex and now has you know, frequency dysuria um, and um, has no uh, small amount of blood in the urine. The smoking and alcohol, etc., you know, all leads on to more complicated factors of TCC or transition from cell carcinoma, for example. Um, EBM, so, you know, if you're going to do a dipstick, is it going to be sensitive and specific enough? You know, what, what is going to be your pretest probability for this person? So, you know, if this person you know, you do the dipstick and, you know, his urine appeared red, but the dipstick says, oh, no, it's not blood. Mm, is that going to be enough for you to happily sleep at night? So say, you know, this guy doesn't necessarily have TCC. Um, you know, was your dipstick right? Um, pathophysiology, so the duration. So, you know, the duration of his illness will, will give some guide to possibly what the cause was, and therefore that might guide your next thing, thought in regards to investigation. Um, pharmacology, so we might throw a drug in there and that might relate to, to something to do with hematuria. Um, in this case, less so, but certainly something you can consider. Public health, so if this was a, you know, say the investigation was the next choice, you know, MRIs are lovely. Everyone wants an MRI, let's go for an MRI. Um, but again, you know, you need to think, okay, well, but what are the costs? What's the cost to the community? What's the cost to the patient? What's the cost in time to your local machine taking away from people? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can sort of see how you know, a simple question on hematuria can have a lot of other aspects or application of knowledge to it, which I think is really important to be aware of. Uh, so Gary, you can go next slide, and then um, I think I'll hand back to you the slide after. Yep. Okay. And then, next one, yep. Yep. Okay. So when we look, similar to Rob, as we look at Miller's Pyramid, the KFP we know, uh, hits the nose how in the pyramid and also hits starts to encroach on the shows how because we're asking candidates to actually for want of a better phrase uh, think aloud and write down their clinical reasoning processes um, and what they think are the most likely differential diagnosis the key investigations um, so we're actually getting them to show us how as well as know how and if we think of we haven't got time in this presentation to look at the whole of clinical reasoning, um, the process, um, but I will touch on something and some resources shortly. But if we think of a tr the tree that's on the right of this screen um, as uh, an undifferentiated problem. So as we, um, and the key features can be defined as sort of unique challenges or steps or decisions um, in the resolution of a clinical problem. And the, the the KFP seeks to assess that process. So if we think of um, this tree being, in Rob's case, uh, uh, say hematuria. So hematuria is the, the big broad uh, trunk at the bottom of the tree. As we move towards a diagnosis, we go through critical steps within the history, within the examination, investigations, and we progress from the trunk up to the final diagnosis or as close to the final diagnosis as we can get. And we move so from trunk to branch, to main branch, to branch, to, to twig, to finally to twiglet. Um, and that could be our, our differential, our final diagnosis. And each of those stages where we hit um, a fork in the branch and then the twig is effectively, effectively one of those key features. Um, and as I said, the KFP is trying seeking to assess each of those stages or parts of those stages because no case is ever going to go through every from woe to go from examination or sorry history through to final resolution of the problem because it's very difficult to write the KFP. It's also um, very easy if you're not careful to cue answers in prior down the case. So we're actually looking at small snippets through um, a clinical process. Um, the content of the KFP, um, similar to the content of the AKT, we draw from the RACG curriculum. We're looking to assess the domains of general practice and we're increasingly 
looking at or expanding the domains that we're assessing because we're, we're actually developing some quite sophisticated questions around professionalism, around practice processes, um, around self-care for GPs. Um, so we're moving beyond just domain two of uh, professional knowledge and skills. The other source for content is Beach. Now, we're fully aware Beach has closed down, but over the 10 years of Beach, there was very little shift in the presentations um, across general practice, across the whole of Australia, um, other than potentially within the mental health arena. So, we know, so there has been some stability to the demographics and also to the, the cases presenting. So we use Beach to give us the, a, a sampling process from the curriculum. And there is one particular chapter in Beach, which I, I feel is very key, particularly for the KFP, and that is, the, is chapter seven, which are the problems managed, um, and then it breaks that down into the most frequent problems managed, the new and acute, and the chronic. And what I organized um, from that chapter was this spreadsheet, and this is just a subsection of it. And I took everything that they listed there and cross-referenced it, whether it appeared in frequent, new and acute, or chronic. Because what I wanted to ensure was we break this myth that the KFP assesses um, esoterica, it, is, it assesses minutiae, and it actually reassures candidates um, and the profession that we are assessing what walks through the door. So the majority of the KFP cases are drawn from this list within Chapter 7 of Beach. And it's a very good place to start for candidates as a, as a, a source for either a a reflective tool so they can assess their confidence on each of these conditions. They can use it as a revise, a revision list, a learning plan um, as well. But it's it's a it's a good it's a good springboard into their revision and their preparation. And also for for us as supervisors to actually look at what we need to be ensuring we cover and we when we have our um, our registrars in the practice. Obviously, not all the cases will come from this list, but the majority will, um, because we also want to cover those cases, such as self-care, self-care as for ourselves as professional practice processes, uh, evidence-based medicine, um, uh, professionalism, uh, legal frameworks. Um, so there will be those, but often we will we will have cases which will. When you first read them, you think, oh, this is not, this is going to be a really difficult case. But it springboards into, um, it's a way of entering into different domains. So, one of the classics, uh, there's a, there was a, I'll use a question because Rob wrote it, um, and it was in the last KFP exam. There was a case that started with a mother asking about the side effects of a particular in childhood immunization, um, and it was addressing some of the, the, the myths within the community about immunization. The second part of the question was the child um, having a reaction immediately after the immunization and how would you manage that situation in practice, that acute situation. And then the third question in that case was the practice nurse then comes to tell you after everything has happened that there was potentially a breach in the cold chain for the vaccines, the vaccines that the child received. And how would you manage that situation? So that was a that's that's where we're taking the KFP because we want to be able to sample across um, as much of the curriculum as possible and as many of the domains as possible. So rather than just following one problem through, um, we're looking at trying to sample, as I say, and and use a case and then start digging deeper into the the reasoning um, and processes of the candidates. Sorry, Gary. So, um, two quick points. Someone yes. is just asking what BEACH stands for and what, what that was. And now the other one is just time. We're going to run out of time. Okay. A note. So we'll have to speed up a bit, I think. <clears throat> okay. My trees are in the rainforest because that's where I live. So that's my answer to that one. But yeah, absolutely. But we need to think, Beck, yeah, where is the tree located? Um, uh, another, 
Nothing and it's much. Not much. And we'll come to that later on. So yeah. the other thing that I will just cover here is extra responses. Um, because one of the things that the, the KFP paper is about is making sure candidates can answer um, and respond to the questions in the context of the case. So again, it's not an all cause list of hematuria. It's about a list of, uh, or it's, it's them approaching the hematuria in the patient and the case that's given. So have they got the right answers and the right differentials for the, the demographics of the pa patient or the exact presentation of the patient? And so one thing we do is if we ask for four questions, we want four answers. Sorry, four answers. We, if we ask for four answers, we want four answers. It's amazing how many candidates just want to dump all their knowledge on the paper and then move on to the next question. And that's, that's not what we're after because that doesn't tell us that they can practice safely. It tells us they know a lot about hematuria, but it doesn't tell us if they can apply that knowledge and treat the patient rationally, yeah, both investigate um, and treat rationally. So if we give, here's an example from a recent paper. Um, so this is what candidates were asked to do. They were asked to give us four answers. Here is the answer grid to that. <clears throat> those in green got a mark and those in black got zero marks. <clears throat> so that was the marking grid. Here is the answer to this question um, by a count one candidate. And this is actually taken directly from the paper. So on the left, um, labeled one to four, are the candidate's answers. So just have a think. What I would say is how many answers do you think this candidate has given? You can have a think. The answer and here, here. There were 11 responses. Now, in, your, in order for all our candidates, our market, our, to all candidates be treated fairly, how would you mark this question? Do you mark the first answer on every line? So rice, NSAID, aspirate, and educate, or do you mark the first four answers, rice, rest, ice, compression, or do you only mark the first four correct answers? Um, so in order to be fair to all candidates, what we actually do is every answer they give us is coded. So in, on the marking system, there will be a, be a box beside every, um, every answer in the marking grid on the right-hand side of the screen, and every time a candidate gives an answer, they will then get a tick against that box. So this candidate gave us 11 responses to a three answer question, sorry, sorry, to a four answer question. So automatically there are seven extra responses. Now we actually give a penalty for the extra responses and that penalty is 0.25% because that is approximately what one answer is worth across the whole paper. Because all of the 26 cases contribute equally to the paper, or 3.85%. And when you break down the number of answers, oh sorry, the number of marks available across the whole paper, it comes down to about 0.25%. So in this case, or in this case here, this candidate gave me 11 responses to a four answer question. They got three right and they lost and they had seven extra responses. So they actually were given a penalty of 1.75%. So 0.25 for every extra response. That 1.75 is taken off their final score at the end of the paper. So once all the weighting and all of the marks are correlated, uh, brought together and all the weighting applied so that um, each, cons each case contributes 3.85%, they then will have 1.75% taken off, or this candidate will have 1.75 taken off their paper. When I first took over the KFP um, some 14 cycles ago, 
we were having on average up to 25 to 30 extra responses per candidate across the paper and what we were seeing was candidates were shot blasting the whole paper as putting down as many answers as they could get because the penalty um and uh, because they were and in that way they were actually getting good scores and there was a way they could play the paper that uh, i didn't deem that was fair we went on the for effect or better word a good marketing campaign um and trying to ensure we informed our candidates on how they were to answer the paper um and we now see that our overcoding rate is down to, on average, four overcodes per candidate across the whole paper. So we're not seeing the shot blasting. We're seeing candidates answer the questions appropriately, um, giving the right number of answers, and answering the, the questions within the context. So we're actually, as I say, avoiding that shot blasting. Um, I think it's a huge move from 30 per candidate down to four there are those candidates who still like to um, dump and run. Uh, in the last exam, I had one candidate who in one question managed to give me uh, approximately 20 overcodes in one particular question. Um, it was a sight to behold, uh, trust me. Um, so the other way of avoiding all this overcoding is to avoid question or joinings. So don't use IE, don't use EG, ANDs. Because if you're creating a list, you're going to overcode, and that's the key. The other important thing is answers that are motherhood and apple pie, such as educate, review, investigate, reassure, refer, or in this case, rice, um, they never get marks within the KFP unless they are clarified. Because if a candidate puts reassure, it doesn't give me any insight into their knowledge. Um, it doesn't know whether they can actually manage the condition they're being presented with. So we do not give marks to those sort of answers. So um, Beck was asking about how we, you know, developing and assessing or developing more the clinical reasoning skills. I know G there are, there's a lot of work out there at the moment uh, around clinical reasoning. Um, here's just a very brief list of the different ways you can do it. And I'm not going to spend time here because I know um, that GPSA has some phenomenal resources. I will come to where are they? Here we go. Some phenomenal resources on clinical reasoning, um, a random case analysis. Um, and in order to leave time for questions at the end, I'm going to leave it here with a random case analysis and teaching clinical reasoning because these are phenomenal resources. I know there's webinars already out there that GPSA have done, and there's a lot in the literature. I give these. I give these brochures um, and the GPSA materials to registrars at conferences to effectively be the agents of change. Going back to their practices to say, look, I'd like to be taught like this, go back to their supervisors, um, to be to look at using case-based analysis as a, I think is the most powerful tool to develop clinical reasoning skills. Um, and the random case analysis brochure and the teaching clinical reasoning really go hand in hand and they are fantastic so well done GPSA um, there's also um, the and I've forgotten the name Glenn if you could remind me of the teaching modules um, and I've gone completely out of my head Glenn, um, which I saw for the first time at the GP Tech um, conference this year um, and they are an amazing resource um, for teaching on specific conditions say acne heart failure they've got brilliant evidence-based material in there and then they actually asked a question which explores the, the the learners clinical reasoning around that problem yeah um, so it's brilliant so they're available on the gpsa website under education resources and they're called the teaching plan and teaching. again they've been based around developed by uh, gp supervisors and they've been um, developed around the most common um, cases uh, yeah. that registrars are likely to see in general practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to go over to there was um, there's a conversation going off in the question box about rice. The reason we don't give rice a mark 
is because in most conditions, you can't rest, ice, compress, and elevate every single thing. And every candidate just, uh, lots of candidates, just write rice. It doesn't tell me they can manage it. Um, and generally, we would not write questions where rice would be an answer because it is just nebulous. So we actually are pretty clever on the way we write them, so we wouldn't do that. But um, coming back to the presentation is that, you know, the KFP is about clinical reasoning. It's a key skill um, for clinicians. I think it's the key skill um, within general practice. Um, our life is managing the undifferentiated patient, um, not the patient that's already been worked up by somebody um, within ED or within another team. And it's, it's key for our, our profession uh, in general practice. Um, that's why I'm passionate about the KFP because I feel it actually tests what we do. Um, in our everyday practice. Rob, okay, do you talk about resources? Yeah, I might, I might quickly talk about some resources because um, I uh, think is, this is pretty important. And we're getting towards the end now, and I don't know for the sake of time, I'll, I'll try and push this through. So sorry if we just a touch over nine. But um, uh, so uh, basically, the aim tonight was to highlight exactly which what the AKT and KFP involve. And I think we, we hopefully touched on that so far. Um, give the give the some of the nuances um, in the AKT and within the KFP. So when you're asked some of the questions about how it's done, what the pass mark is, um, who's writing these questions, etc., then then you guys should have some idea about that. But the key thing I, I think we want to come to now is um, how do you actually help your candidate, or how do you help your registrar, or how do you help your trainee? Um, and um, this is this is a really important thing, and this is where we critically rely on the supervisors who so are doing the bulk of teaching across Australia for these candidates and for um, our, our registrars and our trainees. Um, so uh, this is what I really want to get across to you guys. So um, there are a, a, a myriad. Is now There are so many resources out there now specifically for uh, candidates, with the help of candidates along. So each individual exam, um, the RSCGP website, if you go to the RSCGP website and you look up um, exam support program or ESP, if you want to write that down, the exam support program, you can just Google it. It will come up with all these things in one place. Um, so in there, there's the public report. So at the end of every exam, we actually go through, Gary for the KFP uh, goes through quite quite detailed description of each individual case and what it was involving and, and uh, what were some of the topics. And in there for the AKT, we give some example questions. We talk about what, what people did well, what people didn't do well, and that's a really important resource. Um, the ESO modules, so these are, sorry, just go back a sec. Um, okay. I think it's more on that slide. Um, Oops, sorry. And then we'll go to the... <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we'll just hold off on the pictures for the moment, so I'll go through these. So the ESO modules, just quickly. So these are on uh, GP learning. So everyone here currently, um, who is an RSCGP fellow, has access to these. You can log on, it's in GP learning, you, you just type in ESO uh, modules AKP or ESO module KFP and it will come up for you and it will take you through uh, the same information that's available to the candidate. Some of the stuff we've touched on tonight in a bit more detail about how the questions are structured. There's some example questions in there. Um, so that's a really good resource as a supervisor. If you want to know a little bit more about what, what the candidates are going through and what they're being assessed on, that's a really good resource. Each candidate will get access to a practice exam. That practice exam will be released before their exam and they can sit this. This is often for the AKT, it's given online and the KFP, I think this is the same, Gary. It's used within the same portal as they will use on the actual day. Now, the ideal yep. thing here is to teach people how to actually use the computer systems um, and actually have a look at those. But increasingly, we've realized the benefit of these resources for candidates. So increasingly, we're actually sliding used questions across. I think the KFP is almost all used questions. The AKT is getting there uh, with actual how cohorts went on each individual question. Your candidate will, or they should, they definitely should, be sitting this, and they should be seeing that in advance. They will get sent an email with their responses, with all the answers, with all the interpretation. As a supervisor, it would be a really useful thing to sit down with them and actually go through that information. Hey, you've got this one wrong. Why did you get this wrong? Is this something that we're not seeing? Is this something we haven't talked about? What nuance here do you think we're missing in your study? or in your clinical presentations, or in our teaching sessions, that has led to this answer being wrong. Is this an area we need to explore a little bit more? So practice exam is really useful for that. There is an examination guide on the website that goes through all the detail, again, that we've gone through tonight, in written form, in a lot more detail, the exact stuff that's in there. So 
that's really important. Um, text, um, so uh, there are textbooks, so Mertag obviously is a classic textbook, but, uh, but I generally would suggest that people move more onto online resources because the exams tend to be very uh, current. Um, so some of our online resources, yeah, so thank you Gary. So the AJGP is an absolute wealth of knowledge. I mean, brilliant stuff in there at a good level, it's general practice level. It's not gonna go into the, the nuances of the different types of knee replacement materials that are used and the allergenic properties. It's not, it's not going to go into that sort of depth. Um, it's going to be the general practice stuff that comes through the door. While I'm touching on that, one other thing I wanna make really clear and something I get asked about all the time is the breadth of general practice is so broad. What depth do I go to? And my answer to that is really quite simple. Look at your peers, look at the fellow GPs around you, look at your supervisors and see, would they know this? So if you're studying <clears throat> deep into different types of um, pacemakers and what sort of complication rates they might have as their battery expires at six years, you, as a candidate reading that or studying that, they should think to themselves, okay, is this a piece of knowledge that my supervisor would think I need to know? Is this something that my peer, who I think is a really good doctor, would probably know. Whereas the management of, um, you know, um, uh, acute menorrhage in a young person who's having, uh, who's in their adolescence and their periods of starting, managing something like that is going to be critically more important. And that's the stuff that comes through our door. So AJGP gives a really nice level for that. Mertas gives a nice, don't go into deep point, but obviously some of the guidelines and things are sometimes a little bit off in there. Therapy guidelines is an absolute wealth of knowledge. And this is where we, we go to for our management advice and it's based on our, our experts across the country. That, that's absolute goal. RSCGP has a ridiculous amount of resources now for different things. The, the red book, the green book, the white book, the silver book, the, it, it keeps going on there. There's lots and lots in there. I mean, that is bread and butter general practice. I mean, if you're a candidate going into your exam um, and you haven't read through the red book and you <clears> don't know, <throat> what sort of bowel cancer screening your patient should be having, you're gonna have problems because that's something that the general practice or general practitioners across the country will know. A, a good guide, um, we're not endorsing them specifically, but there's a place to start and just double check. The Australian Doctor Guide to Guidelines, which is again, you just Google Guide to Guidelines Australian Doctor, um, will actually have a list of guidelines in there. They're not all perfect, but again, they're a really good place to start. So if you're looking through the Guide to Guidelines and you go, Oh, there's the um, chronic kidney disease guidelines. I haven't actually looked at those. Or, oh, I forgot to double check the uh, diabetes management handbook. Oh, I need to go back and look at that. Or COPDX. You know, if you're missing these big ticket items, then you're going to have problems in both the ACC, the KFB, and the OSCE, and in seeing patients every day. So that's really important. The other thing on that same note, um, I know I'm helping on point, I'm going as quickly as I can, but it's really important to um, think about what your trainee or your candidate knows and what they don't know. So what I mean by that is if you're if you're a supervisor who's working in an AMS or an Aboriginal Medical Service and your can and your trainee is just seeing very complex chronic disease management stuff, no acute emergency stuff, for example, or 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 maybe some some other aspect of medicine, then you need to keep that in mind for your for your candidate and for your registrar. And you need to think, okay, I need to nudge them towards studying the stuff that we're not seeing here because we're a skin clinic or because um, there's a musculoskeletal doctor who sucks up all the musculoskeletal patients, so no one else sees those. Really, really important. Um, do you want to go on, Gary? Yep. One more slide. Yeah, so this one is, is key. Uh, this is a really important one. So one thing that's really, really useful for candidates, and this is, again, something that, that I think a lot of them go wrong. When I go back and I talk to candidates who, who haven't been successful in the, in the exam, particularly those who we thought should do okay and all their supervisors say hey I can't understand why this person didn't get through or the medical educator is like it seems pretty good to me when I actually dig down a little bit deeper I find that they they do know their stuff but they've got a couple of holes and that's usually what happens to all of us is when we sit down to do some study we generally study the things we see a lot or the things that we're interested in and that is just a human nature thing that's just the way it is so we need to get around that. And a good way of doing that is this ICPC2 code. So it's an international classification of primary care. You can access this online. Just Google ICPC2. It will, you can get a printout of this. 
it is each of the major conditions within each of the major major uh, clinical areas. What I suggest to candidates, and you could do it with them, is that they lit, they go through this list and they mark a three next to the thing they don't think they're very good at, a two next to the thing that they, they think, oh, I'm okay, and a one next to the thing they were a subspecialist in in India, uh, for example. So if they're an infectious disease specialist who's come from overseas and they're now working in general practice, they probably don't need to spend a lot of time in questions on infectious disease, but they may not have done a lot of, say, pediatrics, for example. So by tagging that, what you do is you go, then go back and you go, okay, all the number threes or the ones that I'm not very good at, that's where I'm going to start my study. And you create a study plan from that because we all run out of time. It's a universal thing. No one will get enough time to study. But if you study the thing you're poorest at, you're going to pick up the most amount of marks or the most key features, for example. And that's yeah. really, really important. Anything else you want to add on that, Gary? Um, no, I think you, using this as a, effectively a confidence rating scale is a fantastic uh, way of doing it. I use this with um, the average stars in the practice. Um, I'm actually combining this with that um, Beach 7, uh, Chapter 7 of the Beach, um, is also really good. Um, I was There's just a couple of questions, Rob, if I can just move on to those. Uh, Basil, you asked about... Um, Making sure candidates know about overcoding. I think actually we've been really successful in letting candidates know about overcoding um, Because if we you see that in the significant reduction um, the ESO modules um, These are a great resource to support your candidates um, They're free for all members. They're, they're a member benefit. They're in GP learning So as supervisors you can go into those and actually they're taken the KFP ones, there's two for AKT, two for KFP, two for OSCE. Um, in the AKT and the KFP ones, we go through questions and we break the question down into stages. Um, and it's very interactive. So you put your answers in, you get your feet, get feedback on your answers. And that's, that's um, so I've got supervisors who sit with their registrar doing that ESO module and talk through it. And it's a good way of doing it. And a good way of upskilling yourselves as supervisors in our exams beyond what we've talked about tonight. The practice exams, um, the KFP as well as the AKT will talk about uh, when they complete the KFP practice exam, they will then get an email with the question, their answers, the list of correct answers and the common incorrect answers, and then a rationale for the answers. And they will also then talk about uh, things like the overcoding, and we use that as a way to upskill. So there are lots of ways that we inform candidates about the exam technique and exam process, and the purpose of the practice exam is so they get to also um, use the, the final online environment. There was also a question about um, the Miller's Pyramid and the KFP stands in the middle, um, and why could candidates pass the OSCE and not the KFP? Well, there was this process by which um, prior to 2017, you could put the AKT was your ticket to the OSCE. And we realized that actually that was a very poor educational process. And whilst you, there were those candidates who did hold a, an, AK, a, an AKT pass and then they got an OSCE pass but failed their KFP, that was actually a, a, a minority of candidates and was actually more of an anomaly. And since we have moved from, from that to the AKT and the KFP together being the prerequisite, we've actually seen the OSCE pass rate go up because we're actually getting those candidates who are progressing up Miller's Pyramid or Miller's Triangle um, through the assessment processes as, they, uh, they prog as, the, as the exams are progressing through that level of, of Miller's Pyramid. So that was a change um, in, I think, 2016, um, 2017, where we switched to that model, um, because that's a far better educational model, and then putting that onto education. Um, I hope that answers those questions, Basil, because um, you posed those. Are there any other unanswered questions that we have sat there? Um, or Glenn, have picked up any questions I've not addressed or Rob's not addressed? Because I appreciate time is moving on and Rob and I can talk about the exams 
for a lot longer than an hour. No, I actually think that you've done <laughs> an incredible job at getting through all of the uh, questions. As I said at the start of the session, we'll make sure that we go through all of the questions um, through the chat and also the question and answer section. And if you have missed anything, I'll make sure that um, we get those to you and we get an answer in the frequently asked questions. Yeah. That'll be great. Thanks, Glenn. And um, the I'll put that up again for the, uh, basically, if anyone wants to get involved in the assessment process, um, either from writing to reviewing or trialing, any of that process, then it's it's simply assessment at racgp.org.au. Um, I'll pop that up here. And you can mark it for our attention or if there's specific questions you want to ask us uh, individually, then just uh, send it to assessment at racgp.org.au um, and the, the team will then forward that to us. Um, and we will respond back to you. Fantastic. Listen, uh, uh, Gary and Robin, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of GPSA and the board um, for your contribution. It's amazing how often um, we can cover the same topic and yet the feedback that we get from the KFP and AKT anytime that it's presented um, to the membership is always um, valuable. And um, as you say, the, the the time and effort that's gone into debunking, debunking some of the myths and also spending time on um, getting people to understand, both supervisors and registrars alike, to understand the importance of not overcoding um, has made a, a huge difference in the sector. Um, it was really useful to hear you talk about um, the key things that you recommend uh, in terms of presenting to uh, registrars as, as a supervisor, so I think that will be incredibly useful and uh, without further ado I'm going to wrap up uh, tonight. I would like to acknowledge the RACGP for their contribution as sponsors of this uh, webinar and for your uh, time Gary and Robin and all, for all of you that have attended tonight um, giving up your evening for some professional development um, which ultimately benefits your registrars in the sector. That's uh, emblematic of the generosity of spirit that uh, GP supervisors and GPSA absolutely um, value. So thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thanks guys. I'm going to shut down the webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Good night.